at alarming rate across countries in normal times, but the context of COVID-19 has aggravated these factors. And similar for the other human rights concerns. Um, and now let's hear from our uh, speakers about their country-specific um, experiences. So our first speaker will be Samanthi Paranagam. She is an attorney at law with 26 years of experience in human rights, legal aid, um, women and children issue. She has served with the Human Rights Commission for Sri Lanka from 20, uh, 2005 to 2018, most recently as secretary and previously as director of inquiry and investigation and director of education and special programs. Then our next speaker would be Zoha Vasi. She is the research fellow at the Institute of uh, Global City uh, Policing and uh, University College London and co-director of for the Urban Violence Research Network. She holds a PhD from the School of Security Studies, King's College London, and her research uh, focuses on the provision of public security, police military relations, police minority relations, and urban security. Our next speaker is uh, DSP Deepti Karki. She is the Deputy Superintendent of Nepal uh, Police with the Women, Children, and Senior Citizen Service Directorate. She has held various positions during her 15 years of uh, service to law enforcement, including advisor to the chief of directorate in planning and management, um, and also central focal person for women and children services center nationwide. Ms. Kaki has also served for two years with the UN peacekeeping mission in Liberia, Unmil as a focal point for gender, and as UN advisor for community policing with Liberia National Police. Our next speaker uh, would be Dr. Um, Roshan Kanijo. She is the Assistant Director of Research at the Center for Strategic Studies and Simulation at the United Service Institution of India. And she has uh, worked extensively on armament, disarmament, and nuclear strategy and profile of nuclear weapon states. Our next speaker uh, would be is DIG Amina Begum. She is the Deputy Inspector General in the Protection and Protocol Special Branch, Bangladesh Police. She has served in Chittagong Metropolitan Police and uh, with the Armed Police Battalion. She joined UN Peacekeeping in Timur Leste as Deputy Commander of Bangladesh Formed Police Unit. And she is also the Asia Region Coordinator of International Association of Women Police, IAWP. Uh, we have a final presentation would be from our uh, Latin America and Caribbean uh, unit within DCAF from the Honduras office to share some of their work in Honduras with the national police um, uh, on gender-based violence. After the presentations from the speakers, we will have 30 minutes, uh, hopefully for the question and answer from our participants. So we encourage um, all the participants to put their question uh, comments or questions in the q and section at the bottom of the screen. Uh, where so with that, I will now give the floor to Samanthi um, for her presentation. Yeah. Uh, are you sharing the PowerPoint presentation, Professor? Uh, we, do you want us to or? Yes. Sure. Yeah, uh, good uh, evening, everybody. The, today, the topic uh, is uh, policy and duty pandemic in the workshop that we have to speak about gender-based violence, child protection and trafficking and human rights during health crisis preparedness and recovery in South Asia. So first, I like to see whether these uh, courses, which gives the negative impact, the next slide, please negative impact to the society uh, with the disease increased during the pandemic. Gender-based violence, child protection and trafficking, human rights, whether this is increased during pandemic. Yes, the one thing, uh, the sources that we can uh, find out to see the violations increased during the pandemic, at least one is the institutional statistics. 
The institutional statistics can say that and the local news reports and official discussion set of the institutions head and international organization reports also can be witnessed to show that uh, violations increased. But uh, in my personal opinion is that in Sri Lanka, it's very difficult to find out official institutional statistics show gender-based violence and the human rights violation increased during the pandemic. But with the local news reports, official discussions and the international organization report, it was mentioned that it has been increased. So that gave negative impact badly to the society. So when we talk about gender-based violence, can you go to the other slides, please? Gender-based violence, um, other one. How can we say it is uh, increased? That information from discussions I had with uh, officers who engaged telephone helplines, and yesterday also the presenter from Sri Lanka, DIG, also mentioned uh, it has been increased. The domestic violence has been increased. The nature of violations on domestic violence, we see the women's mental health and well-being, sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights. It has been multiply impact to women and children. And the other point is the violation due to inability to survivors to domestic violence to access support through regular channels. It was, you know, disturbed and it forced them to be more, you know, the, victimization situation increased. Uh, the, when it comes to the child protection, Sri Lanka does have monitoring and protection authority like National Child Protection Authority, Human Rights Commission. So the child protection authority in a discussion, the head of child protection authority informed that torture related child abuse increased 40% and sexual abuse of child children in April increased 65%. When it comes to May, it has been increased 100%. So the information here also we found through the discussion, the head of the National Child Protection Authority gave to the newspaper. So what are the preparedness? What steps were taken by the Child Protection Authority. It, uh, one thing that Child Protection Authority, they strengthened the services of 1929 hotline, introduced Child Protection app, improved network with similar service organization to provide psycho uh, social support and conducted social media discussions free of charge to take care of child during pandemic. This is the uh, Child Protection Authority is a monitoring and protection body. It's a state arm. Um, um, yeah, next slide. Right. So, uh, initial preparedness that when the WHO declared that COVID 19 as a, it's a situation as a pandemic, the executive formulated special tasks for attend to this matter. Then the question came in, what is the legislature, what is the piece of law that we should be adopted to prepare for this pandemic? The Quarantine and Prevention of Disease Act came in, which is 100 years old act. Then from the act itself, there's a provision, the Ministry of Health can issue guidelines uh, uh, state in the regulations, and the proper authority was introduced as a director of health services. And later on, the IGP issued notice prohibiting of public gathering and further he stated his IGP Inspector General of Police. Then he stated that police officers are empowered to arrest persons who are violating quarantine and prevention of disease act without warrant. Um, here are the human rights concerns. With this situation, initial preparedness and you know, looking into the matter, keep public health in a proper manner, the human rights concerns came in like this. Freedom of movement and liberty. The quarantine process, uh, several uh, initiatives taken by the government and the lockdown. Uh, then the second issue is right to perform by final religious rights death of a person. So this effect, like 
delaying PCR test after death. The religious minorities, they requested them to have PCR test within 24 hours. So failing that time limit, they were a bit disturbed and came as uh, for human rights violation uh, to address that matter. The third one is right to religious minority. Cremation is mandatory. WHO declared certain guidelines on deaths, but in Sri Lanka, it was the uh, regular price. Cremation is mandatory. So minority re religious groups, they were disturbed with that. Then they argued on the matter. Then WHO given uh, permission for the burials as well. Why don't? Uh, local laws also accommodate that facility. The other point is right to privacy. Expose victims and their information to media uh, in quarantine places, in, in the centers, the media is going there and in the TV they are exposing and giving some more information to uh, local newspapers. The right to privacy also disturbed uh, of victims. The other one is the, uh, the police was given powers to arrest without warrant. That's also a challenge certain times in, within the Human Rights Commission. And the commission also gave uh, their intervention to that matter as well. Then we'll see how uh, the other one, how the Human Rights Commission uh, intervened to do these matters. That Human Rights Commission can monitor, review, Thus, they can do the protection as well. Intervention of Human Rights Commission. The Human Rights Commission issued recommendations and observations. Yeah. The Human Rights Commission, sorry, uh, issued recommendation and observation of dead bodies in the context of COVID-19 and issued guidelines to Ministry of Health and National Operations Center for Prevention of COVID-19 outbreak, regularizing, requesting them to regularize quarantine process and issued public appeal to avoid hate speech since the cremation and late uh, PCR test results, the religious minorities were disturbed and the hate speech went from both sides and the majority plus the minority. So the commission issued public appeal to avoid hate speech. And the issue notice, uh, be cautious on representation to the police as Human Rights Commission official. It was a public uh, complaint and the police complaint came to the commission. And the commission has issued notice, be cautious on repre representation to the police as human rights officials. The other intervention by the uh, proper authority, that is Director General of Police, uh, sorry, Director General of Health issued the notice, locked down small areas, village by public health staff from their own discretion is prohibited. This is way of uh, how public officers controlled by, controlled by mean, uh, that guided by Director General of Health. Uh, so he requested careful risk analysis is required in consultation with epidemiology unit of uh, Ministry of Health when uh, declaring lockdown on small areas or villages. Um, uh, how the budgetary considerations? So when we talk about the budgetary consideration, government established uh, new funding for this purpose. At the same time, the state could network with international organization to maintain law and order. Uh, so Sri Lanka, US Sri Lanka, World Bank, Asia Foundation, they have helped in numerous ways to state uh, to uh, avoid uh, gender-based violence and to attend uh, child protection mechanisms, implement child protection mechanisms and avoid human rights violations. Uh, one thing, access to survival centers, uh, services to respond and prevention of gender-based violence. Further to that, uh, they support uh, to the Ministry of Health and its implementing agencies to increase gender-based violence, psychosocial support and 
emergency medical services and to provide relevant training and resources to help frontline health workers to respond to gender-based violence and communication campaigns were developed to appeal to abusers to step and encourage survivors to reach out to online services. Further to that, uh, that slide, to formulate sensitive and effective responses to domestic and gender-based violence, uh, to keep women and children they safely in protection of police stations, to build public awareness of domestic and gender-based violence, design and distribute materials such as posters, leaflets, and pamphlets, launching mobile public announcements, advertise survivor services. This kind of activities were greatly supported by the international organization. So uh, uh, policing to build up law and order in a proper way, this was massively help, uh, it seems. Uh, my last point is what are the challenges that we can observe? Maintaining access to basic services continue to be a challenge for both survivors and to the police. Poor knowledge on information technology, although a lot of steps taken by the government plus with the help of the international organizations, the, the poor knowledge on information technology to engage digital activities from both sides, general public and the public officials are it's also new for them to work on these things. So it, it seems it's also a challenge. And protect frontline police personnel, health workers, also the other challenge. And to come up with uh, new strategies uh, and new plans, the data collection on campaigns is very much important. But uh, I, 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 yesterday also I uh, joined this uh, uh, workshop and I saw some countries, uh, they came with very good uh, collection of number of complaints and their data collection is very much uh, um, higher scale. So uh, categorization of complaints, uh, dissemination of data on complaints is uh, poor in that tent, what I notice. So we can share the practices through this kind of workshops. We can introduce the, those best practices uh, to Sri Lanka as well. Overall, that uh, uh, the government steps taken by the government and the support given by the international community uh, help to reduce in whatever the way the gender-based violence, child rights violations and trafficking and the human rights violations also it's, it's commendable. Further to that, the Human Rights, National Human Rights Commission's intervention and uh, child action protection, that kind of monitoring bodies also gave their support to keep law and order and policing in a proper manner. Uh, those are the facts that I like to share with you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Salanti. That was a very good uh, presentation. And now I will, uh, without much ado, give the floor to um, Zohar Bahisim. Great. Thank you, uh, Upasna. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Doha. Thank you again, Upasna and Mr. Aftab Nabi and uh, also DIG Shadil Kharil and everyone who's been uh, helping put together this event. It's an excellent workshop. Um, and it's been a great learning experience. Um, the pandemic has obviously triggered new concerns uh, regarding human rights and civil liberties. And today I'll be touching upon some of these issues uh, concerning human rights and civil liberties in the context of policing pandemic uh, in South Asia, policing the pandemic in South Asia. Um, I suppose I'll be speaking from a, from a civilian's perspective or an observer's perspective, so not from a practitioner's perspective, but in my research, I take both into account. Um, over the next 10 minutes or so, uh, I shall focus on three. Sorry, I don't have a PowerPoint, so I'm just going to be speaking verbally. Um, I'll be focusing on three aspects, but pertaining to the theme of human rights and civil liberties, um, some of which were touched upon uh, in yesterday's session, but I hope to flesh them out a little bit more today. The first issue is that of migration, so internal and regional migration during the pandemic and the response by law enforcement agencies and states. Uh, the second is the ongoing challenge of protests, 
uh, which are a vital component in the fight for civil li liberties around the world, but which add a new dimension uh, to the challenges already faced by law enforcement agencies. Um, and the third looks at the criminalization, uh, looks at criminalization process processes um, and at police use of force to punish violations. For each of these three challenges or issues, I will briefly touch upon what we know so far or what we know generally, um, and then briefly dis discuss what can, what can be done in each of these areas. Um, as has already been mentioned, I'm sure that police departments around the world and especially in developing countries such as South Asia have been ill-prepared to deal with a pandemic of this nature. They did not have existing guidelines or SOPs in place, and sometimes they were not even consulted when SOPs were being designed. Naturally, then, they did not have much guidance to work with when it came to managing migrants or protesters during a public health emergency. They also had, in most, uh, in most cases at least, draconian colonial laws in place that have been shaping police responses and practicing, including the use of force. So let's look at some of these points now. So on migration and refugees, for example. So today I'll mention, you know, three sort of uh, rough examples of the, on the policing of min uh, migrants in South Asia during the pandemic. So in Pakistan, for example, we saw pilgrims returning from Iran after pilgrimage to Zairin. Because of this, the COVID cases coming with the Zairin or the migrants that were returning from Iran to Pakistan created a big challenge for authorities to manage. Practically, yes, law enforcement agencies did not have the capacity to deal with them. But in other ways, there was a kind of stigmatization of religious migrants, particularly Shias, which is very problematic because the Shia, as we know, are a sectarian minority group and they're a persecuted minority in Pakistan. So their maltreatment in quarantine centers and their subsequent stigmatization as the bringers of the virus further created human rights uh, uh, problems and, and, raised, and concerns were raised by human rights activists. In Bangladesh, the Rohingya refugees who have been migrating to Bangladesh um, and who continue to live in camps also reported uh, uh, you know, food insecurity, for example, as the result of the pandemic measures. In addition, the pandemic adversely impacted their household income, education, um, and increased gender-based violence within, these, within the migrant community, within the Rohingya community in Bangladesh. Furthermore, research shows that young refugees in camps in Bangladesh reported concerns around the escalation of, of uh, police and military violence or use of force when lockdown, uh, lockdowns are being enforced. And then in India, yesterday, uh, Dr. Sarangi from the Indian police said that initially the handling of domestic migrant workers was a disaster. The police were ill-prepared on how to respond to the crisis, and the imp and and they they underestimated the impact it would have on internal migrants. Other research published more recently has suggested, and I quote: "Fundamental and economic rights bestowed upon domestic migrant workers and other laborers under labor laws and the Indian Constitution were breached extensively during the lockdown." And the state's policies during the lockdown worsened the condition of domestic migrant workers. So the research shows that migrants die not just due to, due to starvation or exhaustion or suicide, but also at times due to police brutality, denial of medical care, timely med medical care, and bureaucratic delays, demonstrating institutional failure across the state. So what can be done in, 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 this, particular, in this particular aspect or area? So South Asian states, in my opinion, need better policies, of course, around refugees and migrants. These policies need to take uh, need to prioritize human security and humanize migrants, refugees, and other minorities. If states continue to criminalize and marginalize and stigmatize entire communities because of where they come from, then you cannot expect the police to do much better. As such, law enforcement agencies and state institutions need to collectively work together to change the narrative and messaging around migration, whether that migration has happened for economic reasons or political reasons or security reasons. This is especially important during a pandemic because, the, because of their status, because of the status of refugees and migrants, they are much more likely to be adversely impacted during public health emergencies. So the second area I wanted to look at was, dem was demonstrations and protests. Interestingly, the past year, as we all know, has seen protests around the world in spite of and at, at times because of the, the public health emergency, from Black Lives Matter in the US to NSARS in Nigeria and more recently Kill the Bill in the UK. 
it has been a very charged year and public sentiments have been quite inflamed it's because of this and because of the multiplication of public grievances that policing and law was perceived demand greater critical consideration and a demand more critical conversation because the pandemic is not over protests are increasing and policing therefore cannot continue the way it has for the past several decades in south asia so in india for example we saw protests around uh, the controversial citizenship act and more recently we saw the farmers protests during some of these concerns were raised that the police was using the covid-19 restrictions in place to arrest protesters so police response is likely to you know like police police sort of mishandling of such protests is likely to aggravate public grievances around an already sensitive issue to put it mildly um in bangladesh we saw uh, for instance protests by garment workers who were protesting the non payment of wages during a pandemic the police responded to these protesters in one instance with the use of water cannons and tear gas shells to disperse the workers and more recently yesterday i think uh, we saw protests against covid restrictions turn violent in one area and protesters also attacked a police station in return which led to three protesters being shot and one dead so far as far as i know at the moment in pakistan we have also seen protesters by garment workers doctors students and opposition parties in some of and some of these the police has uh, clashed and even arrested protesters and in the protest by opposition parties for example in pakistan hundreds of activists were booked in the country for organizing protests and defying covid-19 guidelines So, what can be done in this area? The criminalization of protests and demonstrations because of a public health emergency is not the answer. You also cannot be arresting protesters on mass because where will you keep them? So, on the part of the police, the leadership needs to do a better job of meeting with protest leaders and organizers and community representatives to ensure the protests are as peaceful as possible, as as or as you know as avoidable as possible in some cases. and if they can't be avoided and if they can't be you know and if, if the police cannot take charge of such negotiation then this negotiation needs to be kind of you know put to you know put to the kind of prioritized by other stakeholders politicians bureaucrats ngos etc but beyond that states need to devise better policies to preempt the grievances of workers party workers and civil society from aggravating during a public health emergency Unfortunately we are seeing trends of authoritarian policies increasing in South Asia so that is unlikely to bode well for police community relations going forward so my third and final area was looking at criminalization and i wanted to look at criminalization of non compliance and police use of force together because both are interconnected in the context of policing covid-19 in South Asia so what do we know we know that in South Asia the police are currently arresting people for spreading misinformation about the virus in bangladesh for example authorities have arrested people for posting on social media about the virus in sri lanka we we been told uh, there have been reports of of police in order to arrest uh, those who are critical of the police or police in practices and those who are sharing fake messages about the pandemic something that is likely to you know seriously impinge upon the freedom of speech and something that's going to definitely be get some push back from human rights organizations um in pakistan last year we saw police were arresting uh, or fining people for not complying and more recently they have in in one city they have threatened again to arrest people for not wearing masks um even though a lot of those who are arrested or detained by the police will be released later it still puts a necessary pressure on people and it's it's going to put a necessary pressure on police officers as well because they'll be more exposed to the virus and therefore their their stress and anxiety will also be increased and you know on both sides there's going to be grievances so it's not going to bode well for police community relations either and then furthermore the criminalization of non compliance and violations of public health regulations means that violators protesters and minorities and migrants may be seen and viewed as potential threats which then opens them or makes them vulnerable to becoming victims of police use of force especially in countries that are governed by legal frameworks um designed under colonial rule which by their very nature are known to be discriminatory and a little bit sort of you know intolerant to put it to put it nicely um so what what can be done um first instead of arresting people for spreading misinformation or sharing their opinions and experiences on social media state institutions including law enforcement agencies need to get on top of their communication strategies and the messaging practices 
the state and its institutions and officers need to get ahead of the messaging around the pandemic and vaccination programs now as well, not criminalize and penalize ordinary citizens for sharing the content online, even if it's problematic. Secondly, instead of arresting violators, perhaps the issuance of fines may be a better approach. And I think this was mentioned yesterday by one of the participants as well. Third, the militarization of policing in South Asia needs to be critically addressed. Some countries have seen the use of militaries and paramilitary soldiers in urban areas to police and enforce COVID-19 regulations and restrictions. This is going, this can potentially exacerbate feelings of insecurity and increase the anxiety of people and further compromise the legitimacy of state institutions, especially the police who are then seen as not doing their job properly if, if somebody else needs to be called in to do, do the job for them. So in conclusion, um, I'm just giving a snapshot of the concerns around human rights and civil liberties in South Asia in the context of policing and public health emergencies. Each of these issues, migration, protests, and criminalization, demands greater critical exploration. Um, and as the pandemic continues, cases are surging across South Asia. We may, we may see further constraints uh, on individual freedoms, which will disproportionately impact marginalized communities, minorities, and some of the most vulnerable groups in South Asia. So the over-policing of these groups will not be the answer, and police legitimacy may continue being challenged if grievances continue to rise. So I have just tried to give an observer's perspective just to add to the ongoing conversation. It doesn't take away from the, you know, the challenges faced by practitioners and officers. It's only to help us think about the challenges of entire societies in the long run. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Zoha. Um, we surely will take all these points uh, in during our uh, discussion rounds as well. So without much uh, further ado, I will uh, request um, DSP Deepti Kaki to present, do her presentation from Nepal Police. Deepti, please. Um, DSP Deepti, you are muted. Hello, hello, is it okay now? It's good, all good. Uh, thank you, Pasna. And good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge the, the distinguished panel of speakers and the organizers of this uh, special event. Uh, thank you so much for letting us share our experience from Nepal. Uh, on the effects of pandemic on the vulnerable groups of society, especially women and children. So well, considering the time limit that I'm given today, uh, let me start by stating that my brief presentation and analysis today will be based uh, purely on the gender-based violence data that Nepal police has registered in last few months uh, of, uh, of lockdown, which is a strict lockdown and the partial lockdown. And I'll also be comparing the data with the uh, period before COVID. So uh, I'll briefly be highlighting on the on the after effect of this health emergency on women and children in terms of crime only. So the and the lessons that we have learned uh, from the response that Nepal police made in this situation. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Sopani yes. So this is the brief outline of my presentation today. So, well, uh, first and foremost, uh, for first and foremost character that we uh, experienced about this uh, pandemic was its gender biasness. So, as we all know that all the crisis situation has a differential impact on different groups of society. Uh, it has more serious effect on women and children, the vulnerable groups. Uh, we already have enormous wealth of knowledge among us uh, regarding this topic, so I'll not be elaborating much on this. Um, so now let me go through some figures here. Uh, next slide, please. Next. So normally in an average, next slide. Normally in an average, we uh, kind of register 40 to 45,000 cases of uh, different nature in police as a formal case. So among that before COVID, we saw that there is, there, we used to experience that there is 30% cases which is directly related to gender-based violence, which is uh, targeted to specific groups of the society, which is uh, women and girls in our case. But after the outbreak, we experienced uh, a radical change in the crime scenario. So uh, stay-at-home mandates, uh, kind of brought sudden 
alteration and change in lives of people all over the world. So ultimately it affected the crime uh, dynamics. So, and one of the positive byproducts, by the way, uh, of this event that we experienced is a dramatic drop in, in, in overall crime rate. Uh, but, but if we talk about the gender-based violence cases in Nepal, as compared to pre-COVID situation, uh, it seemed to have risen alarmingly. Overall crime rate decreased, but the GVV or the gender-based violence cases has, uh, we can see it is risen. risen. Uh, can you go back to the previous slide, please? Previous? Agari ka slide. Agari, Agari, yes. Uh, and um, by gender-based violence cases, <coughs> What I'm referring here the, are the cases of sexual violence like rape, uh, attempted rape, child sexual abuse, and some of the social crimes or the cases related to harmful social practices like uh, untouchability, polygamy, accusation of uh, witchcraft, uh, menstrual taboo, uh, child marriage, uh, and uh, most importantly, domestic violence. So now let me share a comparative data of uh, normal times uh, before COVID with the data that we registered after COVID. Uh, so uh, the fiscal year uh, of Nepal, uh, taking that baseline, uh, which is June to April 2019 to 2021, which is uh, 11 and 11 months before and after. So here I have also included few such crimes, which is not directly uh, gender violence cases, but uh, but if we examine into the finer details, uh, we saw a bigger surge or a bigger um, gender deviation in crimes like suicide and cybercrime. So I've also included those into my presentation. Uh, next, please. Put any kaldinus. Okay. So this is the graph and it is self-explanatory as you can see. Um, here we found number of striking uh, figures, as you can see there. We have significantly low crime reporting rate uh, in the first few months uh, in all forms of gender-based violence. But this figure slowly changed as we go on to the subsequent months. Reporting of sexual crime slowly increased, which is like uh, from 15 to 16% increment that we saw after COVID. Um, and cybercrime against women and children also increased, uh, which may be because people started uh, uh, spending more time online. Um, an overall suicide rate also showed uphill trend, especially that of women and, and, and girls. And the inner dynamics of the, of the uh, sexual crime also showed some, some uh, alarming facts. More girl child between the age of 10 to 16 uh, were found to be the victims of uh, sexual violence after COVID, which was not the case before COVID. So, and um, here, um, you know, but uh, one of the interesting facts that I want to draw everybody's attention here uh, today is that uh, though we can see uh, heightened percentage of uh, gender-based violence cases after COVID, uh, there is a serious drop. Uh, uh, I stress that again, there is a serious drop in the cases of domestic violence, uh, cases registered, registration in Nepal police after COVID, which is contrary to the everybody's expectation and which is contrary to the global trend. So that is what we experienced here, which we will I will further explain in my next slide. Next, please. Yes, in normal times before COVID, uh, domestic violence is the number one crime that Nepal police registered uh, on a daily basis or in a yearly. Uh, in an average, we file around uh, 30 to 40 cases of domestic violence daily, which is like 12,000 to 14,000 cases in a year. Uh, but while the world was experiencing massive surge in the case of domestic violence globally during lockdown, we had the opposite situation in Nepal. So we even experienced almost 90% drop in the cases of domestic violence registration in police in early days. Next, please. Okay. Based on the analysis of the data that is reported in, in, in police, we have come across a number of causes behind gender-based violence uh, data deviation during the pandemic. Uh, so why was there less reporting um, in early lockdown days? Was it really less crime or was it just the no, uh, less reporting or both? So here is what we have found. So uh, according to our analysis, um, 
number one reason is the diverted focus of people. There was less crime because people were more concerned about their health and other factors other of life than, than uh, committing crime. So number two is there is less opportunity. There was less opportunity for the criminal and the victim to meet for the crime to occur during the lockdown. So there was less crime. So number three, suddenly the police and the security personnel were everywhere. Uh, they were more vigilant. Even the uh, family, the social groups, uh, watch groups were more alert. So there was a uh, less opportunity for the criminal to, uh, to for, 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 for the crime. And number four, we have often experienced that uh, some of the factors, like some of the substances, like drugs and alcohol, are one of the instigating factors for uh, gender-based violence cases against women and, and, and girls. But since the lockdown, these are, the access to these substances were limited. So um, crime got decreased. Next, please. So on the other side, we suspected that the cases were there more than before but uh, they were not reaching out to the authorities as before. And the reason we estimated uh, where, uh, number one is again, uh, the moment restriction and the limitation of access to uh, support services for victims, especially in case of violence inside the family, uh, victims might have been in ethical dilemma or, or in fear for, to reach out any sort of uh, help being close to the offender themselves. Uh, that must be the reason why there was no less reporting. And number two, mostly the victims do not have idea or information about uh, the reporting channels and mechanisms. Even if they do, they lack the access skill and they have uh, no or less idea about the internet and the use of technology uh, and the internet. And number three is most elderly and children cannot speak out for themselves or are or they are kept in captivity or fear or dependent to the offender themselves, so which restricts them from reporting. Uh, uh, and number four, as in the normal times, most of the gender based violence victims show lesser trust and confidence in the formal reporting mechanism of government, which got intensified during the pandemic. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the uh, number one reason being more and more percentage of the offender. Uh, as someone is found to be someone who is known to the victim, or in our case, a very close family member. So number five is another possible reason for data showing few numbers of domestic violence um, cases being registered in police during the pandemic is a, a non-prioritization of those cases by the police themselves as being non-urgent or psychological or mental. Uh, violence. On the other hand, uh, this is only the reflection of the cases of domestic violence that are registered in police. So, but in our domestic violence law, there are a number of other channels or number of other agencies that the victims and go victims can go and report. So, maybe there is a the, the data get got scattered or uh, data got uh, leak. There is a leakage of data. So, we registered only a few cases. Next, please. So talking about the challenges, uh, we do not have any different challenges than any other police agencies, I suppose. So as we all know that Pedna, because suddenly it was very uh, unprecedented and alien for all of us. So we, uh, we started off with, uh, you know, no plan, no blueprint, nothing in our hand. We were just out there uh, whatsoever. So we already had a number of challenges already in policing regarding communication, staffing, resource availability, uh, services and all, which got accelerated by the uh, pandemic and the lockdown. And number two is COVID was a threat of life for everyone and more so for the law enforcement agencies or frontliners. Uh, so suddenly police was asked to perform multiple roles and dual role, which is contrasting to each other. We were, you know, asked to perform traditional role as a law enforcer. We were enforcing laws. I mean, uh, enforcing those strict lockdown policies. At the same time, we were asked to perform humanitarian work as well as um, distributors of uh, health. Uh, what is it called? Health stuff, uh, protective equipment. Um, and our hotline numbers got jammed. We had little or no proper idea about the health consequences of this uh, virus, but had no option but to be out there in public 
which gave us tremendous uh, mental pressure also. So number three, information was everywhere and nowhere at the same time during the, the, the early lockdown period. Um, and being the front face of the state, we had to deal with uh, whatever came across with self-initiation and uh, intuition in early days of pandemic. But uh, there was no integrated data or information available for us. And number four, support services for gender-based violence uh, survivors, uh, like psych social care, um, safe houses, counseling, medical facilities uh, were either non-existent or very uh, limited. And they had their own criteria and protocols to follow, but we had no choice but to confront them and to support them in whatever way we could. Uh, number five, uh, government and non-government agencies, everyone was working on their own. Uh, from their own front, but uh, there was a lack of coordination between the agencies, that is what we felt, and um, there was a, a, a lack of a guiding light. Next, please. So this, uh, the, these are some of the lessons that we learned from uh, our perspective. The lessons that we learned from COVID-19 is, uh, is, is very, very relevant and is going to stay there for years, I suppose. So here is a glimpse of what we've learned uh, in terms of our own service delivery and uh, internal self-management. So I'll start with the, the service delivery as aspect uh, regarding the management of our own system, our, our own service delivery, I mean. Uh, COVID was very sudden, as I already said, uh, everyone was, uh, you know, uh, so its 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 response was supposed to be more practical than than theoretical. Um, so we were lo we were learning by doing. So the very first thing that we realized uh, is the importance of the use of technology and shift in conventional reporting mechanism. So we stressed more on online case registration uh, through mobile application, official social media, email, and through hotline rather than in personal visits. Uh, it also served to convey our messages and, messages and respond to the inquiries. Um, and number two is the continuation of the flow of correct information to the target group was uh, equally crucial in all phases of pandemic. For this, we use the social media platform of not only police, but uh, that of other stakeholder agencies as well. So this time around, the platform of protection cluster of Nepal, led by Ministry of Women, Children and Senior Citizens, really came in handy for us. And number three is one of the challenges that we discussed earlier was regarding the health aspect, healthcare aspect of this pandemic. Uh, so we realized that as as the regular healthcare system was already uh, overstretched, overwhelmed, uh, it was imperative to identify alternative healthcare system for GVB survivors during the pandemic uh, to lessen the burden of mainstream hospitals. So for this, I, we, we, we uh, use the platform of uh, uh, hospital-based crisis management center. This is one-stop center. Uh, I believe this kind of center is operational in other South Asian countries as well. So we use that platform. And we also suggested that the other private hospitals can also be used as an alternative uh, healthcare facilities for GBB survivors. And number four, we received all sort of calls and information which were not necessarily urgent or related to police service during the pandemic. Our hotlines where I already said it was pretty overwhelmed with all this information. So we felt that we need to categorize the urgency and set up a 24 hour virtual uh, integrated virtual services for those non-emergency needs, which do not outrightly needed the physical care and support. So basically uh, for psychosocial and legal counseling and reference to other agencies, for this we coordinated with several other organizations and uh, circulated the, the contact information to our police units all over the country. And number five, it is now imperative to work in close contact with the school administration after they reopen. Uh, to tell them to be more vigilant towards their students uh, post lockdown and increase reporting to uh, detect any signs of violence uh, during their home stay. And also we are planning to, uh, uh, to talk to the parents to check in the online uh, conduct of their kids. Uh, can you go on please, Argo? Okay. 
Another hugely important aspect of the overall management of this pandemic was the internal or self-management of the of the system itself. So, which is a care for the caregivers. So, uh, recognition of the fact that police cannot serve the public effectively unless they are to receive care and uh, and support. Uh, so, to make sure that the police itself do not get infected or or pose risk to the communities they serve, including their uh, their families and including colleagues. Uh, our department supported in online orientation of psychosocial first aid uh, uh, and, and stress, stress management for more and more frontliners. Uh, di we distributed protective equipments and uh, gears. Uh, and uh, our directorate of women, children, and senior citizen, uh, uh, you know, prepared and widely circulated a general guideline to be followed by police personnel while addressing cases of gender-based violence during the times of crisis. And we also prepared a video material on basic safety measures for police and we widely circulated. So if you require these documents, uh, we can provide that. So number two is secondly, we coordinated with the central data uh, unit of police to collect and analyze the gender-based violence data during the pandemic period, which usually uh, supported in further planning and policy making. Um, and number three is meaningful participation of women police uh, in every front of policing was felt very, very uh, crucial during the time of this uh, pandemic. You know, what I mean to say by this is that it, the mainstreaming, gender mainstreaming was uh, very important uh, in everyday policing as a frontliners, uh, like in response to gender-based violence cases or in quarantine duties and also the uh, effective participation of women police was felt very, very effective in, in policy making and planning level as well. So talking about the human, human rights issue, uh, opening up of services and placement of support uh, systems alone did not ensure full access to justice. Uh, but we realized that uh, the, key, uh, the cause behind the low rates of reporting in police is more related to trust in the system than to the you know, placement of these uh, mechanisms. So, uh, uh, you know, thus uh, we we must ensure that our workers uh, in the in the in the ground strictly follow the protocols of human rights in enforcing law uh, uh, regarding the lockdown and 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 quarantine measures because their conduct and behavior on ground affects the police public trust and ultimately to the reporting issue. That is what we realized. And number five is most often, you know, women and girls feel secure and comfortable to approach frontliners other than police. What I mean by this is uh, the health workers, uh, social organizations, community networks, etc., for their problem, but do not outrightly disclose their situation as GVV victims. So uh, these, gr these groups, I mean, those frontliners who are other than police must be specially trained or oriented to respond and detect the signs of disclosure of violence. And they must have knowledge of the referral pathways. So uh, here I come to the end of my, my presentation. Uh, so in a nutshell, we still don't know how long this COVID is going to last and how it's going to evolve in the days to come. Uh, though it has brought so many challenges, uh, it has also given us the opportunity to scale up our services. Um, I'm extremely honored to be part of this very, very crucial event. Uh, though we come from different backgrounds and speak different languages, we have uh, the common objective as policemen and women. Uh, that is how I feel, that is how I, we feel. And thank you again, DCAF Janiba, for this opportunity uh, and this unique experience. Wishing you all the very best. Thank you so much. Thank you, DSB. Uh, Deepthi, I think I can't concur more with you that the past two days has been really um, a good uh, sharing of experience and also enhancing our, our understanding of this um, evolving uh, pandemic. It's we are not over it. The world, as we were discussing yesterday, we're still going into the third and the second uh, lockdown phases. So, uh, with that, uh, can, uh, can I give the floor and request DIG uh, um, Amina Begum from Bangladesh Police to give her presentation, please? Can you hear me? Thank you, Koshana. You hear me? All good. So, thank you very much and very good, good afternoon to the all the uh, uh, distinguished panelists. Uh, I'm very much honored to take part in the CAF workshop presentation on, on gender-based violence, child protection and trafficking and other human rights concerns. 
such as appropriate use of force during health crisis preparedness and recovery in South Asia. So uh, for the last one hour, uh, we heard what happened in Pakistan and Sri Lanka, as well as in Nepal. And uh, the Nepal, I, uh, I heard it's almost same in Bangladesh. The crime figure, the crime data, regular crime was not uh, decreased and the domestic violence later on increased. Now we are passing in Bangladesh, the second wave, uh, the number of patients, they declined. Uh, in February, it was only 200, but in March today, it is 7,000. So we are passing the set second wave and uh, during that time from uh, from september to december it decreased but it's uh, it's common though we are in different language this pandemic is common in in every state in every country in every uh, religion and other other geographic state we are in a common we are facing a common challenge that is a pandemic Crisis, health crisis. So for this health crisis, during this health crisis, we took, uh, my question was on uh, COVID-19 health crisis effects on domestic gender-based violence and child protection issue. Uh, this was the issue for, first the issue was the joblessness for the pending. Because of the lockdown, we enforced the lockdown uh, in the first wave. Uh, that is in March 2020, 2020 uh, uh, that was the time of the uh, lockdown for months, for three months. Uh, so we have to enforce first. So at that time, uh, many people were jobless. And that was the reason behind increasing the job, uh, domestic violence and rape, especially child marriage and sexual abuse child exploitation because the schools were closed. And uh, later on, uh, the child of the working woman, especially the government's workers, their children were uh, somehow exposed to this sort of uh, exploitation crime. And that was our challenges. And the challenge is uh, how we can respond those crises like, uh, in our uh, last one year, we uh, we are working on triple nine, the national emergency calls service. And you will be happy to know that this uh, triple nine service is 80% of the call receiver are women police officers. And they took the phone and divert to the concerned police station. For 100 years centenary of um, uh, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, we, Bangladesh Police, has started a new initiative, a new initiative uh, for uh, addressing this gender-based violence. That is, we said women and children help us in every police station because we realize that uh, the women that come to the police station or if she knows that there is police, male police officers, they do not feel free to talk with the male police officers. Then our plan is to set uh, women and children help desk in every police station. And we started in 2020 and we got tremendous response from the women and children sector, especially from people because uh, every family has, um, those family has that sort of problem. They, now are now free to talk with police and information that is, we wanted more information that Nepal uh, DSP Dipti, she, uh, she told, uh, she uh, presented that uh, there is less reporting. And this challenge we also face is here, the less reporting. So we, uh, we encourage and we do uh, uh, publish many, uh, times that we have triple nine service. The other service that we did to uh, challenge, uh, cope up with this uh, uh, gender-based violence issue and to reporting system, 
because nowadays uh, people are for for pandemic or for lockdown women are more exposed to uh, cyber uh, internet and uh, uh, cyber sector and they face now cyber bullying or in fake id problem and they are being harassed so we started an all women cyber support for female users and this is run by women police officers uh, high ranking women police officers they they can they have a contact with the uh, women that complains and they feel free to talk with the issues with the with her privacy so for the awareness and the these are the these are uh, the training in training sector we set different modules and bangladesh police has set a special operational procedure sop for pandemic because uh, as joha wasim she was telling that police has enforced some lockdown so during the lockdown or mask wearing even in singapore uh, there is enforcement and enforcement there sometime it causes some uh, unpleasant uh, consequence but in bangladesh that is why we set an sop for pandemic and this sop has described how police will act on the lockdown process and how do will how do they will work with the frontliners that is the health workers and in during the lock, lockdown time they help shifting patients taking dead bodies for the burial even the uh, bangladesh police has helped uh, thousands and more than hundreds and thousands of jobless people with uh, food support and uh, in uh, cox's bazar un women helped bangladesh police for uh, training gender based violence counseling training uh, to the police personnel those who are working in the rohingya shelter where the migrants are uh, is, uh, uh, taking their shelters in cox's bazar uh, that joa uh, washim was telling yes there is more than 10 lakh women and children and uh, rohingyas are uh, stationed in that migrant camps and uh, we are helping them uh, with these issues also there is some issues on child exploitation and uh, the we set uh, a module for gender addressing gender based violence in police training schools and uh, for uh, training for the uh, officers but in during the uh, uh, during the pandemic time uh, uh, in like nepal our suicide case also increased and uh, uh, also the gender based violence now it has increased i told you that it is uh, the reason is poverty sometime and uh, joblessness so we, now our challenge is how we will address this gender based violence uh, we uh, we i now at this moment i don't have the exact data and how this number has increased but i i am here uh, hopeful that we are able to address the gender based violence in every police station officers the, those are who who are working who bangladesh police headquarters we are monitoring and uh, it has close monitor uh, and implementation of uh, addressing uh, these gender based violence issues uh, so this is uh, uh, somehow my answers uh, for your questions on addressing gender based violence thank you upashana Thank you, Dia Jamina. That was really a good uh, reflection on Bangladesh Police, what the efforts they've been undertaking in these difficult times. And also, we will be hearing uh, in the Q and A more uh, from uh, from you. And also, thank you for accepting um, the request to be participants in this workshop on such a short notice. Um, now, with that, I will give the floor to Dr. Roshan Kanijo from um, uh, India to give presentation. Thank you, Pasna. Firstly, I would like to thank Dr. Albert and Upasana for giving me a chance to share my views. 
and hello all the panelists and everybody attending. As we know that gender equality is the fifth amongst the sustainable development goals by UN. And this will not be possible if gender-based violence is not addressed. And the two factors which I consider very important in tackling gender-based violence are education and economic independence for the women. If we see the literacy rate, just take three countries, India and Bangladesh, if we see the women literacy rate are somewhat similar, say about 70% or so, the Pakistan is much lesser. If we take the economic independence, we find all across, the women are more dependent on their husbands. And uh, the effect of COVID-19, as far as India is concerned, in the initial few months were quite high. And uh, like many countries globally, the pandemic was a shock. And the nations were not prepared for this kind of a, a calamity. So I find that the nature of GVB in most of the countries remained the same especially in South Asia, the intensity may change from country to country. So the basic problems what was faced in India were the cruelty by husbands and relatives. Uh, that was the base, uh, major portion of the crimes against women. Since most of the families, they have joint families. Now they can also, the, in the joint families, it can have the dual role. They can protect also and they can become the perpetrators also. The second thing was the sexual violence also increased. And the third thing which the uh, previous speaker also spoke about was mental stress due to financial instability. Uh, the female job loss rates was about 1.8 times higher than the male job uh, loss. For example, the woman account uh, for 23% of the overall job losses, that is uh, four amongst 10 women lost jobs in India. The other thing is, due to lockdown, women were primarily caretakers in a family. And since everyone was at home, the stress level increased. So there was mental and physical exhaustion for the women. Uh, as far as the health issues were concerned, there were initially, there were lack of uh, access to healthcare, especially uh, to the maternal healthcare in the rural sector during the early stages. Uh, but this improved as uh, the things became clearer. Supply chains were uh, disrupted. So it was harder for the women and especially in the rural areas, even for uh, availability of essentials like uh, sanitary napkins and things like that, especially for the poor women. And uh, uh, children also, we found that the children abuse cases have also increased. Childline India Helpline received more number of calls than the average uh, calls which they receive. The National Crime Reco uh, Records Bureau also found that uh, there were high number of women in child trafficking during uh, 2020. But the situation has improved somehow now as the governments are more aware, they have become a little more experienced and they are uh, capable of tackling the pandemic somewhat. So various measures which the Indian government has taken, I would like to highlight those. Uh, as far as uh, measures are concerned, there were more awareness campaigns which gained momentum. There was a petition which was filed by the All India Council of Human Rights, Liberties and Social Justice. There were two judgments uh, which were given by JNK High Court and the other by the Delhi High Court, which issues uh, certain guidelines to the responders now, as far as the responders are concerned in India, we have uh, many agencies who look, look into the uh, women and child care uh, things. We have the Ministry of Women and Child Development, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. We have National Commission for Women and every state has a National Commission uh, for Women. There is a Ministry of Information and Broadcasting of India, which was also e equally important in uh, spreading the message uh, so they all geared up through various measures. And uh, some of the measures which were adopted were they increased the availability of call-in service to facilitate discrete reporting of abuses. They created emergency helplines. They increased the tele-online legal and counseling services for women and girls. There were designated informal safe space for women which were created 
in grocery stores and uh, pharmacies where the women can report domestic violence abuses without alerting the perpetrators. Uh, now, also, there were uh, publicity was also given in regard to the inform in this in regard to the information sharing and also the availability of the facilities for seeking relief and redressal against these issues. There was 24 seven helpline for women in distress. Uh, as far as child uh, abuse is concerned, the responders stated that they were in contact with the child welfare committees, juvenile justice boards, district child protection units, and um, others in order to address the issues of children. They were also video conferencing which were taking place. Now, uh, we also have a lot of NGOs who are also working round the clock in uh, addressing these problems. As far as the judicial system is concerned, I can say India has a very strong legal, legal system. Uh, we have a protection of women from Domestic Violence Act, the Sexual Harassment of Women at Workplace Act, the Immoral Traffic Act, the Drowdy Prohibition Act. We also have the Protection of Children Against Sexual Offense Act. So we have got a lot of acts which look into various aspects of gender-based violence. Now, as far as police was concerned, since police is a state subject, hence every state had their own mechanism to deal with this. In some states, police had formed an exclusive cells to deal with this menace. And uh, they had domestic conflict resolution centers, which were created, and they were under the direct supervision of the district police chiefs. In some cases, the police patrol party reached the location within two hours of receiving the complaints to check its uh, veracity. Now, as we know that a large number of women are also staying in the rural areas. And uh, the, at the rural level, we had initially a prob uh, little problem when the lockdown took place. But uh, soon, we have what we call as the Integrated Child Development Services Scheme, which has about 13.77 lakh centers all over India. And so we made use of those workers and their role were modified and were used to execute COVID-19 related works. And they were coordinating between the impacted person and the senior officers, and they could also register the cases uh, in the uh, rural areas. Then we also ha had what we called as the social health activists or the ASHA workers who also were involved in frontline COVID preventive works. Uh, they formed a major part of the healthcare network at the family, uh, at the village level. So uh, since they are the residents at the village, and they're familiar with the daily affairs of that particular area. So we also use the services of them and they were modified to become the uh, mediator between the two. Uh, in spite of taking all these measures, the challenges were to coax the victim to come forward. Often we find that the family traditions do not allow them to take judicial help. Among the uh, victims who took help, the percentage was very less. And those who approached the police or the doctors or the lawyers or the society, uh, service, uh, social service organizations were also less. Um, but they prefer to take help from the immediate family. Secondly, the economic dependence on the husbands were there. So that also prevented them from coming out. Thirdly, there was the inability of women and children from the economic weaker section of the society to access online platforms uh, for assistance. Now, apart from the measures which were taken previously, there were also other measures which were taken. Certain things are, require societal change and it is a long-term process, but the awareness campaign has already started and both at the government and the private NGO levels work is in progress. Like Ministry of Women and Child Development, Government of India had initiated a one-stop center to support women affected by violence in uh, private and public spaces. There were protection officers, there were shelter homes which were created. 
uh, they were also using women only economic self help groups for training uh, women in financial uh, literacy uh, there were schemes like ujwala schemes which is a comprehensive scheme for prevention of trafficking and rescue rehabilitation and reintegration of victims of uh, trafficking for commercial sexual exploitation there were also other schemes which tried to uh, bring greater awareness amongst the women now we know that all this is a very long journey like loud sui when he stated a journey of 1000 miles becomes begins with a small step so a lot of small small steps have been taken by the indian government but the responsibility also lies both with the government and with the public to come out and uh, avail the facilities which are um, available and for that we need to make the women economically more stronger to take bolder actions thank you thank you dr uh, roshan um i think the dr salangi will add on to your uh, just uh, presentation uh, dr salangi yeah uh, thank you pasana um when the pandemic started uh, there were many who expected uh, crimes against women and children to rise and initially there was some such data emerging from western countries particularly uh, from england uh, where i spent 5 years in in the university um but i uh, as a student of psychology always believed that crime against women and children will go down so um in all the discussions uh, i dissuaded people not to be concerned about this particular problem and why so uh, because the hypothesis that crime against women will go up because now women and men are together because children spend more time at home and because of the presumption that they have less access to law enforcement so crime will go up that was the assumption um i would refer you to a beautiful book written by rebecca solnit um she has compiled a history of various crises that the world has faced and uh, what she has argued is that it's a book called a paradise built in hell um and what she has argued and that is the understanding in psychology that in periods of extreme crisis natural disaster people actually become far more empathetic right they try to help each other they go out of their way to help each other in fact during the pandemic we saw an outpouring of altruistic feeling in society with people of all sections coming forward to help each other in fact i had much more food packets uh, being received than i could even distribute everyone was offering to help this is the altruistic feeling in human beings in fact the first essay is beautifully titled it's called the uses of disaster and the subheading is uh, notes on bad weather and good government so when you have bad weather you actually have good government because you know when you have an earthquake you have a tsunami you have a cyclone people actually are in their best self they become the best human being so this assumption that the crime crimes against women would go up was proved to be totally wrong in fact crime sharply declined our uh, uh, women desks had no job to do they would keep waiting and we would keep finding out has anyone complained of domestic violence and they would keep saying no 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 that's that's what happened in reality uh, as regards uh, protests increasing again that's again i don't think protests in a democracy is part of democracy uh, so protests will happen uh, in india particularly it's a, as uh, mr choudhury was saying country of million mutinies um, um, so uh, naipaul's language so uh, it, it protests is very natural here there are agitations demonstrations all the while i don't think there is any correlation between covid and uh, farmers uh, agitation you know that's a false causation that we are trying to link uh, there are issues in handling public order situation that is 
but that is something apart from the main theme of covid so i would suggest or i would uh, submit that uh, the understanding within theoretical psychology uh, is that in periods of natural disaster calamities when there is threat to human civilization do not expect crimes against women and children to rise and then do not propose a false narrative and then try and disprove it yourself by showing statistics that it did not happen because that is very well known in psychology thank you well, thank you uh, dr sarangi i think there is much much more needs to be uh, learned in this area and as uh, dsp dp uh, khaki had also suggested uh, through the data that they found that there was no correlation um but i think these are the factors that we have to just keep in mind to make sure that the, any national health uh, preparedness uh, and response policies and laws that are drafted in the future they reflect on these issues they touch upon these issues so uh, thank you for that and with that we are running uh, uh, out of time so i will uh, uh, give the floor to mr enrique uh, gonyalon uh, he is a project coordinator uh, from the latin america and caribbean unit in within dcap to share the findings that and the work that they have been doing in uh, in honduras office they have done a, a lot of work with the police on gender based violence during pandemic so i'll just request him to share a very brief uh, summary of uh, uh, their work thank you and thanks so much well first of all thank you for the invitation and secondly now we we will we'll all move from south asia to to latin america that i hope the cooperative vision is is interesting for you all so i'll share my screen and uh, well can you see it um it's coming yeah we can see it good so well i i like to introduce you to the to our policy advisory program in the honduras office which is uh, a four year program um Founded by the Swiss, uh, the Swiss government. There are three main outcomes under this program, and I'll try, I'll try to be as as brief as possible. There are three main outcomes, which are uh, modernization, uh, community policing, and uh, support the police education system. I'll focus on the on the first outcome, modernization, under which we have the gender uh, component. Uh, some figures. some figures i'd like to share with you uh, or the most important figure is that uh, in 2019 there was an increase of 22% of uh, injuries towards towards uh, towards uh, women um, as a cross cutting point that I, i i while listening to you to interventions uh, the honduras police was not an exception and it was not ready it was actually unprepared to face such a pandemic and uh, and that uh, in a way affected how to how to how to deal with gender based uh, violence in in, uh, in Honduras additionally to that uh, to that there were two two hurricanes in Honduras which uh, made the situation uh, even even worse uh, during during the pandemic uh, what was uh, the cap response it was mostly at two levels knowledge transfer and support and an advisory advisory work since we have a, an office an office there in the field in terms of knowledge transfer and support we translated we translated the gender toolkit material into spanish we have the gender and security division at the cap so most of the materials were in french uh, english and other languages so we translated them into spanish especially those focused on on the on the role of police on in terms of gender also we conducted some gender workshops some conferences at national level for uh, in order to empower female police officers and we also um facilitate the participation on of the honduras uh, police in international congresses such as one in in um, in colombia in peace building and and gender uh two international webinars were conducted one on the on the gender self assessment which is a tool that uh, some of you may know it's a tool developed by the gender and security division in order to internally uh, assess uh, how uh, what gender has a cross cutting issue within within the police so one of the seminars was was a comparative experience uh, lessons learned between colombia police honduras police the georgian and the moldavian police and another one 
was on uh, gender how to how the police faces gender based violence in the region. So we had seven countries, and there was a good platform to to change uh, experiences and lessons learned, good, practice, good practices, so and so forth. Uh, another training, and that's I, I, I find as one of the flagships. Uh, we work jointly with the police, judges, and prosecutors. So we 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 don't get stuck with the police, but the we have a joint training for them to to better understand what are what are they what the mutual procedures are because they do need to to coordinate in all the steps with, when the police gets uh, information about about the case on gender based violence, and uh, furthermore. We supported with uh, protection personal equipment to face the, the the pandemic for the police. So we bought material for them to face the pandemic. There was an advisory work. Uh, we got a request from the Honduras police to to give them some recommendations on how to respond how to respond to gender based violence during during the pandemic, and also the gender self assessment previously mentioned. On uh, our recommendations, there were at three levels: access, understand, and adapt and respond. In terms of access, uh, our advice was to ensure strong communication uh, with all areas of population, especially in rural areas. Also to strengthen and consolidate the complaint system, internal and external complaint system within the police. Um, another one was to review requirements of police officer, officers and internal staff who may be vulnerable to infection and uh, for trained police officers in gender-based violence. In terms of understand, Apart from access, it was very important for the police to understand what the situation is. Then they can they can respond accordingly. So review data, statistics, and analysis, uh, and in order to identify patterns and, and behaviors and trends. And in addition to that, to understand changes in perpetrator behavior, whether this is in the home, online, and interfamilial. Also, it was important to adapt and respond. Uh, therefore, in here, we urge to collaborate with other state agencies and civil society organizations. Um, it, it provides psychical and mental health legal advice and advocacy for, for victims, and also uh, to review shelter and alternative accommodation capacities and access, which is managed uh, by, by, the, by the police. Um, What was policy in response to the CAF recommendations? Well, uh, the director general of the police sent an instruction to each of, to each of uh, his police commanders, uh, ordering them to prioritize reports on gender based violence. Uh, there were specific protocols in place uh, to draw coordination between local actors, so including civil society organizations, which I, it's one of the points that some, some of the um, uh, interventions raised the importance to, to coordination with civil society. There was a targeted communication campaign uh, in order uh, and which with the support of uh, social media, print television, uh, to use uh, to cascade the campaign materials. That was to inform about the, how to report gender based, based violence, how to communicate, all the procedures, all the steps, all so forth. Um, there were permanent and real time conversations that were made possible between agencies via the coordination of multiple actors. There was the training of police officers to, to respond to gender-based violence and the consolidation of all reporting lines. Uh, and that includes, as I said before, the training for police, judges, and prosecutors. Uh, and uh, that was so our, our advisory role, our, our response role. But additionally, this, there is the gender self-assessment, which is ongoing. It's not just uh, ad hoc for the, based on the, on the pandemic, but we started before. But anyway, it's uh, in order to, to, to get internal findings from the police that will also um, help the Honduras police to face gender-based violence over a pandemic or over a non-healthy non crisis. And we used four um, methodologies, survey, interviews, document revision, direct observation, and uh, well, as main successes of the gender self-assessment, uh, we got, first of all, we got the approval. So that means, uh, willingness from the police and some of us talked about behavioral change or cultural change within the institution that's uh, that's um, that reflects or shows this cultural change within the institution this authorization and uh, there were in the framework of this gender self assessment there were training of uh, police officers and different exchanges with other offices from other countries as i said before and uh, out of it will come up with a sort of recommendations 
support for the police. Some of them may be public, that depends on, on the on the police. And based on these recommendations, we'll develop an action plan to 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 work on gender internally but externally also towards the community. Well, thanks so much. I hope uh, it was of your interest. Uh, thank you, Enric, uh, for the for sharing the the experience and um, your work in with the Honduras Police, and especially during the on gender based violence uh, during the COVID nineteen. Um, and now I would thank Henry, Could you take the position? Yeah, yeah, I'm trying. Just. Uh... Mm -hmm. Uh, so I would uh, take this opportunity to thank all the speakers uh, for, for sharing their uh, country perspectives. Um, and uh, we do uh, um, have few